exploring the relationship between ant colony optimization algorithm and Snell's law. So let's begin. First I'm going to go over a principle called Fermat's principle of least time. Um, before going into the actual principle, I'm going to start off with a problem. Now, this is a problem that can be really complex, but here it's going to be put into a real-world situation. Let's say that this is point A and this is point B, and you are at point A trying to get to point B. Now, what is the path of least time? Not necessarily the shortest by distance path, but the path of least time, or the fastest path. Well, I get two common answers for this question. Either the blue path or the red path. The justification behind the blue path is that distances minimize. They think still the shortest path is the path of least time. The justification behind the red path is, well, time spent on V2, this is the slower side, is minimized. Now, this is the slower side because this is snow and this is pavement. Think of it like that. It's pavement, snow. Obviously, V2 is less than V1, these being velocities, because you travel slower on the snow. That is why many claim that the red path is the optimal path of least time, being that time spent on the slower part is minimized. Well, these are the advantages. There are disadvantages as well, though. As you'll notice, one's advantage is the other, other's disadvantage. So the disadvantage for the blue path is that time spent on V2 is maximized. The disadvantage for the red path is that overall distance is maximized. So what is the path of least time? Well, not exactly, being that we don't have numbers here yet, but just an approximation would be the green path. A perfect balance of the two that takes advantage of minimizing distance on V2, or time spent on V2, and not maximizing the distance, the overall distance so much. So um, the way to solve this problem to find the exact path of least time, not just an approximation like we do have it here in this drawing, would be uh, first to set up a function. As you can see, this function outputs t being time. So this is the time it takes to traverse the path. Now this function has a variable of x. The way this function is postulated will be explained in detail the next slide. And, of course, the objective is to find the path of least time, so therefore you're trying to find the minimum of this function. Now, one way is to actually graph this function. This is the graph of the function. And finding the minimum would be using a graphing tool, such as Desmos, you know, finding at what point x do we have the least time. Another way is if you're familiar with it, the first derivative test. Finding the derivative of this function and setting the derivative equal to zero. We have one here and one over three here because our velocities in such case are assumed to be v1 equals one sorry v1 equals uh, yeah v1 equals one and v2 equals three. Now postulating the function. It may look a little complex, but bear with me, it's really not. If you know Pythagorean theorem and the formula for velocity, then, then you'll be t completely fine. So, um, you know that velocity equals, uh, you know, uh, displacement over time, which is a vector quantity. In this case, though, it's mainly just going to be a speed quantity. But from that, we can, you know, you get that distance over velocity equals time. So if you have distance 1, this distance, this segment, over v1, you get the time of travel for this segment. Same thing for this part. So adding those together gives you the overall time of travel. Now, 
D1 and D2 equal, by Pythagorean theorem, the square root of z squared plus z squared, z squared plus y squared, sorry, and respectively the square root of b squared plus c squared. b squared, c squared, y squared, z squared. Now you can break this down, and y squared and c squared, those are going to be constant values, if you know the distances, of course. In this case, y squared and c squared, you'll, you know, you have c squared here and y squared here. They're each going to equal 17. So let me check that. 16, sorry. Each going to equal 16. And we know that 16 squared is 256. So you plug those in. Now the next part. This is where it gets a little tricky. This is where we get our input x from. Now the path of least time, if assuming that media 1 is slower, you know, your, your velocity over media 1 is slower than velocity over media 2, then obviously the path is going to go this way. So it's going to be something like this. So z is going to decrease and b is going to increase. Now take note that whatever factor z decreases by, b increases by. So that's how we get here. z minus x and z plus x. Now the reason we converted b to z is because in such case z and b are equal. As this one decreases, this one increases. And from here, you just plug in 12 for z, which in this case, again, right here, this distance is 12. And you have your function. Now, if you find your velocity over each surface, then you're able to output time and, of course, use the graphing utility or the first derivative test to find the minimum of this function. Now, Snell's Law. As you notice in the title, we have Snell's Law. Snell's Law is basically what we just came up with. You can postulate this very simply um, by converting these two into signs, and then n1 and n2 being your velocities. I'm not going to do it for you because it's pretty basic, but you can convert these. They go hand in hand. So, I'm going to go over something called the ant colony optimization algorithm. This is why we're using ants in this experiment. Now, one of the advantages of ant colony optimization algorithm, take note of the algorithm, is that it does not require distance, velocity, and such. As remember here, you know, you need to know the velocity. Even, you know, in Snell's Law, you need to know um, these distances and, I mean, you know, Either way, you're, you're, you're going to need to know angles. Here you see I have sine. So there's all these, these things you need to know, these, these values you need to know to find the path of least time. Now in the algorithm, you don't need to know such values. An algorithm, it's you know computer-based. It's, it's, it's not function-based. It's for loop-based. It's if statement-based. Now I'm going to explain this algorithm to you. Nothing too, I'm not going to go into computer science terms, so don't, don't worry. So now, if you're going from the nest to the food source, it all starts off with one ant. Now, one ant, as you can see, you know, the ant first finds the food, and then the ant travels back to the nest. Now, this ant leaves what's called a pheromone trail. This is a hydrocarbon-based chemical that is left behind. Now another ant, as you can see here we have another little section, this ant tends to follow the chemically stronger trail. So an ant may follow this pheromone-based trail, but then another ant may come in and form another pheromone-based trail, and you have a bunch of ants that are following these trails. Now the elegance of this process is that the pheromone evaporates at a constant rate over time. Therefore, a path that takes longer to traverse, its pheromone will have a longer time to evaporate, leaving it to be chemically weaker. A path that takes a shorter time to traverse, its pheromone will have a shorter time to evaporate, leaving it to be chemically stronger. And over time, 
After a few trials, the pheromone becomes stronger and stronger on the path of least time until a point of what is known as, as establishment. If you've ever seen your aunts in your kitchen following a, you know, a neatly organized trail, that's, that's the established trail. Now, this is applicable in uh, networking. It's very common for, you know, networks. They have to find the path of least time. It's all for efficiency. They have a bunch of points and lines to choose from. And, of course, you'll realize that in networking, you can't have all these knowns. You can't know, you know, assume that you know the distance, the velocity of the network, the network signal, and so on. That, that way, an algorithm is a lot more effective. <clears throat> So, um, this kind of brings up another mathematical problem called the Traveling Salesman Problem, or TSP, where a salesman, per se, starts at the origin right here. Can't tell, looks like Massachusetts. And he has to travel to every city at least one time and return to the origin. Sorry, I shouldn't say at least one time, only one time. He has to travel to every city only once and return to the origin. Now the point is to find the path of least time, the fastest way to reach every city just once and return to the origin. And you can kind of see how the ant colony optimization algorithm would work as a solution to this problem. Now going back to um, this problem right here. Um, the, the objective, one of the objectives of this experiment was to observe ants to find how accurate they are in finding the path of least time using the ant colony optimization algorithm. Now you'll remember here, you know, we used uh, functions and uh, first derivative test and graphs and again, you know, all these known values like velocity and sine and all these crazy mumbo jumbo. Ants don't need that. Ants, without a central authority, only with the facilitation of pheromones, these chemical trails, are able to find the path of least time. It's amazing how something so natural, something so little, that we see as almost nothing, can perform what we need calculus to do. Now, another beautiful thing is that light also does the same thing. There's not necessarily an algorithm for it that I can explain to you right now, but there is a reason why light does this. There is a way that it does this. So light does not travel at a constant velocity through all media. Light can travel through water, it can travel through glass, it can travel through air, it can travel through a vacuum, and then light's velocity in all of these media are different. Now when light traversing two media, as the example we have here, air and glass, light refracts or bends at the perfect angle to meet the path of least time. Now this is the principle known as Fermat's principle of least time, which of course was, you know, uh, developed by Pierre de Fermat. This guy was born 1601 and he was actually a French lawyer, but also had developments that led to infinitesimal calculus. Now this principle was developed and published in his book Optics, or a treatise of the reflections, refractions, and flexions, and colors of light. Optics was a very big subject around this time. And that is all for this presentation.